Good evening, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to Denver, Colorado for the last interview of our two days of coverage here at MWISE. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined with John Furrier. Yeah. John, I feel smarter. I feel yeah. like yeah. we are battling for- My brain is full right now with cybersecurity <laughs> knowledge. My, my brain is full and my head is light from the elevation. I don't know about you. It's a great, great, great week. Yes, oh, it's been an absolutely outstanding week, and I couldn't think of a better way to close it off with the best dressed person on this stage. Nader, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. How has the last two days been for you? It, it's been great. Uh, the talks have been amazing. The different uh, kind of vendors that are here that are kind of forward thinking, that are kind of at the foremost yeah. of cybersecurity. So just being in places with like-minded individuals with the same passions, it just is a great experience all the time. Yeah, the community here just feels really good. It's oh, my yeah. first MYS and I'm already, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm convinced and, and an advocate. Yeah. You gave a talk earlier today, speaking of your day. Weaponized convenience. Can you give us a couple of highlights from what you shared with the audience? Yeah, so the talk is mainly about uh, where we are starting to see threat actors utilize what we call remote access tools, RATs, or the industry properly terms them remote monitoring and management tools. And what we're seeing is threat actors are basically utilizing those tools to maintain persistence in organizations during their attacks and able to laterally move throughout the environment. So they're just kind of piggybacking off of already existing tool sets in the environment or just going inside and downloading their own uh, thing. So we want to kind of call that out and highlight it because we're starting to see it all over. So they're, they're, you're seeing much more happening right now. This is yeah. one of the trends happening across the threat landscape then. Exactly. Like just last year, around 10% of our uh, investigations had some sort of remote management tool abuse. But when you look at the remote management tool market share and you look at the next 10 years, it's only going to get uh, larger. So we're anticipating it's going to be more than 10% as we go on. What can some people do now to be mindful of that ramp up in terms of protecting themselves? I would say that's, you know, you can always protect what you can, right? Sometimes a remote management tool may have a vulnerability that comes out similar to what happened with Screen Connect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, those are stuff that are unavoidable from a organizational standpoint. What you can do is protect what you can control. So things like hardening the environment, ensuring you know, you're know you blocking the remote access capabilities, of those tools being able to be leveraged, and just understanding what is your what remote tools are we utilizing in your environment, and then blocking all the other ones. So as part of my talk, uh, we actually put together a kind of a hunting script that you can use in your environment that you can scour your entire environment and it'll go through 50 or 60 different remote tools that we've seen through Active Utilize. And with those tools, you can then start to block uh, those that are not in your, uh, you know, your normal day-to-day -day, uh, administration. So this dual nature of the RAT and the RM, the either remote access tools or remote monitoring, how do you differentiate who gets what access between the tools, is that a problem? I mean, or is that more the defense side? Uh, are these, I mean, I can put it this way. On the, on the governance side, where's the failure come from on these tools? So the tools itself, it's, so the use of like, the tools are definitely great for small and medium sized businesses. For If you don't have a large service set, you don't have a service set in each of your major offices, the ability for you to remote assistance and being able to also uh, video record uh, the sessions. And actually the cool thing about some of our talk that we had is we actually have a video recording of the threat actor inside the session. It recorded the, his entire session. We were able to show a little bit snippet of what they were doing and like going on like Google and getting on AD Explorer. And like it's part of our uh, video, we actually see the threat actor go there and interact with uh, the internet and go to like OneDrive and they actually saw the threat actor put in the password, he got the password wrong, they got the password wrong, they went to put the password again, uh, checked the uh, little eye icon to see the password, Yeah. and we saw the whole password of the threat actor before they submitted it. It wasn't complex, by the way, so bad hygiene on the threat actor. So when you give the tools out for the remote. That's great, though. Like, what a, what a wonderful way to check. Oh, yeah. I mean, and totally caught red-handed in that moment. From an investigator standpoint, 
Sorry, you don't have to tell a lot of stories because usually we have to use a lot of like uh, forensic data and data like, hey, here's the video that tells you exactly what they did. That's sort of what I was thinking. Yeah. It's not just this inconclusive, you know, web of data points telling a story for a convention. It's it's it's, ILO. it's like it's a, a ring a, cam, yeah. but for but for yeah, cyber threat. Exactly. So like like getting back to your uh, question, there's a lot of great governance things that can happen. Yeah, it's more of a lot of time. Majority of the incidents we're in, it's actually getting piggybacked off of tools that are not approved by the organization. Yeah. Things like AnyDesk, Splashtop, TeamViewer. These are all common remote tools that let's just say organization A yeah. is not having. It's not yeah. an approved tool, but it's not blocked. Yeah. So they could just come in and have the ability to have that remote. Uh, and a security yeah. team's got to have the tools like you do to identify what's legitimate and who's malicious. Yeah. I mean, how does that work? Does that happen on one side? Because that's, you You guys caught them red-handed with the password. Yeah. I mean, that's a key part for security teams to know who's legit. Exactly, and that's one of the reasons why some of these tools are very hard, uh, very lucrative for threat actors, because if it's a legitimate tool, it's going to blend in, because you're going to create exceptions in your EDR, or your Sentinel ones, because right. they are supposed to maneuver through the environment, because that is the, its job. Uh, you know, there's certain times where certain things like they can tunnel mm -hmm. uh, traffic from, let's say, workstation one uh, wants to talk to workstation two. It can physically talk to workstation one and uh, two directly or three. It has to tunnel in between two to get to three. So there's certain things that you can block from a configuration standpoint, I think from a governance at least there. But a lot of times, if it's a, a legitimate tool and they're piggybacking off of that legitimate tool, those traffic is hard to see. So a lot of times what we're trying to do is proactively threat hunt in an environment to say, hey, here's these 50, 60. All of these are not approved list. Let's start blocking it at the firewall, right? Mm -hmm. Certain tools use a very specific port uh, as a way to have a communication. You can block that at the firewall level. When you don't see the password, how do you identify the actor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sometimes uh, with the way we identify a lot of threat actors, mm -hmm. we try to cluster them based off of the different ways, what we call like TTPs, different tools, techniques, and procedures, how they maneuver, yeah. what different tooling they use as part of their mission. So that's how when we start to put these uh, you know, threat actors, you hear about APT29 and 38. Those are after 10 years of seeing a constant you know, uh, pattern of the way when they're in an environment, they have these specific tools that they want to utilize. Maybe the, the tooling may change, but the overarching mission stays the same. And that's how we're kind of able to start to pinpoint out and what we'd like to do, threat attribution, which many, it's really big at. So I, I love it. You're talking about all the different tools, 50, 60 different tools that you can start blocking and testing and, and, and to do some threat detection. Are there types of tools that are most commonly used for nefarious things by bad actors? Yeah, so I mentioned a little bit like AnyDesk, Splashtop, TeamViewer. Those are things that we see the lion's share of it. It's so it is you, the bulk, yeah. A lot of it. Uh, it's, yeah, definitely the bulk. Uh, but you know, in reality, you block those tools, another five to 10 will come about. It's, right. it's playing a little bit of whack-a-mole when it comes to these tools. It's when we first started this script of scouring an environment, looking at the remote tools, it used, the script used to only look at 10 tools a couple of years ago. Oh, now wow. it's 50 to 60 because it's more things we're seeing. Yeah. In our investigations, we're adding it in there and it's just a matter of time. It's going to be over 100 pretty soon. So remote tools tend to be for probably leaner organizations, virtual companies. Yeah. Um, for companies that are relying on, they say third parties or MSPs, how do they ensure the security piece? I mean, is there, is there a playbook? Is there, or is that a problem? Or what's, how does that, is that, is that an area that becomes an issue? Yeah, so a lot of MSPs are utilizing, uh, either have their own uh, RMM, or remote management tool. So a lot of uh, MSPs are starting to do that, where they have their own tool set to have help with the remote administration, uh, if they're doing their operations management. A lot of uh, organizations, especially the larger MSPs, that's where you start to see a lot of companies get um, acquired that have that type of capability. Because from an MSP standpoint, that's kind of what you want, right? You want to be able to have that one-stop shop from that standpoint. And your advice would be, okay, make sure that this bulletproof, completely vetted, grill, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. otherwise weaponization happens. Exactly, so that's why if you were to get an MSP from a playbook standpoint, that's one of the questions you'll ask. If you do remote management, what are you utilizing for your remote management? You know, is it, oh, we have our own tools. Yeah. I'm a little bit more 
uh, happy about that. If it's a secondary ter tertiary tool set, what is that? So I know in my environment, if I start to see that, I know it's not a bad guy, it's actually you guys utilizing it. Yeah, it's you doing your job essentially. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't want to stand in the way of, there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of conversation about AI in cybersecurity. Yep. What's your take? Are we, is, is, is the threat level from, from bad actors overhyped? Is it going to be a tool that helps us defend ourselves much more effectively? Is it going to neutralize out because both sides have it? What do you think? Uh, it's a little bit of both. So I, I feel like, and I've been saying this for about almost a couple years now, right now I feel like the blue team, the good guy side, has a little bit of a leg up because most of the AI that we're seeing utilize it's always in the initial access phase mm -hmm. so in getting let's say deep fake e uh, video uh, voice call things like that these are all in the initial access get that initial access but we haven't seen a lot of AI in terms of after initial access is granted what happens after that is just your normal typical run of the mill with defense side we have the ability to utilize tools that you know rely on AI as a defense mechanism but also able to create like queries on the fly, like Google SecOps has Gemini built in. Right. I can create a query by just talking to it and say, I need a query. Normally, during IRs, if we're going into somebody else's Splunk instance and we're trying to create a query, to, we have to understand how are they parsing their variables, you know, what are the ways, when you have it built in, we can just type in plain English and it can produce a very large query that normally it'll take you maybe a couple of hours to kind of rectify and make it perfectly right. So yeah, I feel like oh, right yeah. now, we have a good chance of continuously to stay ahead, but knowing that just a matter of time before the red AI, as we like to our bad AI, start to catch us up, because there may be an automated process from initial access going down how they automatically go and throughout the entire process. You brought up red, red and blue. I'd love to get your thoughts on the red teaming. Oh, your area. How do you see that being successful? Came up big time on the keynote. You know, hey, get your red teaming, simulate, get that real, get ready for that red lever up moment where you got to you know, recover, contain. Um, Kevin was big on that on the keynote this year. Oh yeah, so that's something that Manny and Red Team is actually doing is leveraging what we call Red AI, using AI in terms of the Red Team, the simulating, the phishing emails, yeah. Being able to simulate the whole phishing email, and because we can start it a lot quicker, the campaign, we can walk through an entire phishing campaign throughout an organization a lot quicker than because you had to set up the infrastructure, you had to set up the right email, but with the AI, we're leveraging that and being able to utilize it for a lot of our red team engagement. So I think if you uh, you have to definitely start to utilize it. Like I said, red AI is, is here, yeah. We, uh, from a, an organizational standpoint, you want to make sure your red team organization, whoever is doing it, has to be leveraging some way. Take us through a day in the life of your job. Um, a, a good, put a couple of days together. Give us one snapshot of a day in the life, a slice of your life. What is it, what's it like? What do you do? And what are some of the things you work on? And um, yeah, take us through that, uh, so the, the lifestyle. In my life. So I would say uh, I we have a two full thing within my or in my team where. We are, so we're a part of the investigative team. So there's a Manion investigation team that we get called in, organizations breached. Uh, we help with the investigation, but really my team is focused on containment and remediation. Trying to contain and plug the holes the attacker was able to utilize and exploit, but also kick the bad guys out. So that's a lot of the time. Clear and Pulp Fiction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like to say, well, we're, we're not the good guys. <laughs> really bringing it here for the last one. Yeah. I was thinking of a boat with some holes in it, yeah. and you're trying to get the water out yeah. while you plug the hole, yeah. and so still steer towards shore. Yeah, we're going to clean things up, get the bad guys we out. Pulp Fiction. Yeah, yeah and we're it. just trying to get the water out and not plug in the holes, the attacker can get, yeah. still come back in. Yeah. So we're trying to, uh, so a lot of times my team is focused on trying to contain, remediate, and kind of kick out the bad guys, as well as another uh, function of my team is taking those learnings and then putting it into proactive assessments. So I've been part of engagements where I'm doing an AWS review for an organization, a proactive review, and in the middle of the engagement, I get called up to do an IR for a major AWS breach, and some of the learnings that we saw from the IR 
I then take some of the learning, go straight into our assessments. So because the threat actors are changing, if you're just using your generic CIS top 20, where well, they're good, their CIS benchmarks, they're good, but with the way the threat landscape is uh, changing, you definitely want to always take these directly from the front lines. Well, and to be able to repopulate it through everything, both internally as well as your other customers and everybody else that you're helping deal with their incidents or prevent incidents, it's, it's amazing. The cultural collaboration and the information exchange in the cybersecurity community is extraordinarily remarkable. And, and we're all about that. The public-private, we're part of JCDC, right? The yeah. public-private partnership, being able to take learnings from our uh, like front lines knowledge, because we have a very unique aspect because we see the latest and greatest attacks and then being able to take that and, you know, give as much data to the general public as much as possible. Because at the end of the day, the security community is a big family and we have to protect each other. Because if one person is vulnerable, we will maybe all be vulnerable. And we saw that with the major things like solar winds and all that, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, you're a big family and you protect all of us as a big family, as, as citizens exactly. citizens of, of the world. You talked about a day in the life. All right, I'm curious. Because you're our last interview, you're going to get some of my zest to your questions. So... If I, you're hanging out with your friends out to eat at one of the fine places in Houston, as we were talking about food, and they look at you and they go, Nader, how do I protect myself as an individual? Since you see all of this at such great scale, yeah. what do you tell an individual for their own personal protection? That's great. I actually get asked that question a lot. I actually. figured you might. Yeah. You're kind of that friend, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. So I would say, one, ensure you're not using common passwords across the board because your password has probably been compromised in some way, shape, or form of, from a previous breach. Utilize some sort of password manager, mm -hmm. LastPass, KeyPass, something like that to have different passwords. MFA everything you can, and ensuring that you're using strong MFA. And one thing I talk about in my talk as well is not all MFA is equal. For you know, multi-factor authentication, ensuring that you're not only using SMS, you're using what is like the authenticator app, yeah. Whatever, Google Authenticator, Azure Authenticator, whatever Authenticator app you want to choose. That way you have like a one-time password and it's not something you are proving uh, because there is something called MFA fatigue where oh, yeah. you just keep MFAing and then one day somebody's going to hit approve and now they're in, right? Right. Oh, yeah. So definitely MFA, different passwords would, from a general person who's just trying to live life and not in the cybersecurity, I think that is going to really help out a lot. Awesome. I like it. I think you're absolutely right, Nader. This has been fantastic. Thank, Thank you for you so being much. a brilliant close to what has been a Appreciate fantastic week. We look forward to having you on again. This is great. Thank you so and, much. And uh, thank you for advising us and your friends on, on MFA and making sure everybody sticks to it. I feel like it's only going to get worse from now on. John, thank you. Savannah, thank you. What a show we've what had. What a show. What a great show. show. Great guys here. Killing and it. thank you to Tony, Christian, Andrew, Ken, and Alex who make the magic happen behind the camera and keep us warm on this incredibly arctically cold set. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, thank you to our fantastic fantastic security community for tuning in. We couldn't do any of this without you. My name is Savannah Peterson from Denver, Colorado at MWISE. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.